Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Father in heaven, we thank you for this beautiful place. We thank you for your beautiful whales. And we pray if you don't mind, just throw a whale in the in the background during the message. We'd all love that. But mm. more importantly, Lord, we want to hear from you. We want to uh, see your word opened up, Lord. We pray that you'd use Pastor Izzy to speak to each one of us, Lord, to encourage us, to guide us through this week. We ask that now in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Well, guys, if you turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Last week we did the first paragraph of the chapter, and it's a, this is a really meaty chapter in the Bible. This is one Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, and chapter 10, as a, as a new believer, I only knew one verse from this chapter. It's verse 13. You know, like, you know how certain verses, key verses, you know, people, they say, do you know any verses in um, the Gospels? And they're like, John 3, 16? I'm like, yeah. You know, they, they know the God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son verse. And, and sometimes you just know one verse from a, a, a particular chapter or book. Even th that might be the only verse you know from that whole book. But this chapter that we're in, the, the end of the second paragraph, the first paragraph we looked at last week, and I'll recap it for you in just a minute. And the second paragraph ends with this verse, verse 13, that there is no temptation, no temptation that has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful. Now, such as is common, in other words, there's no temptation you're going through that is new. Such as is common to man. I mean, all the temptations, think of it. Are there any new temptations? That, that, or, you know, there's lusting or wanting, you know, riches or what. There's no, literally, you, you ever wonder why the devil is, does it? He doesn't even have to be original. He can use the same ploys, the same little bait and traps to entrap people. Generation, if we really, if we were really different than our forefathers, he would have to change up the, the whole, you know, trip us up thing. But, you know. It, for, for the guys, he just sends a cute-looking woman, and, and she starts flirting, and they, there he goes, falls into them. You know, it, it's not like new stuff. He doesn't have to get original. It's, so, so Paul says there's not, not a single temptation that is new. It's common to every man. These are, and these, by the way, this is great words of comfort to me. Like, I'm not the only one being tempted. Well, that's what it's saying. I'm just paraphrasing, okay? But, but this... This verse stuck out to me because it was like, you're not the only one. That, have you ever felt like you're going through a temptation and you're thinking, but I'm the only one that's ever probably ever had this temptation, you know, to 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 whatever it was. You're you're, you're you might have been tempted to, I don't know, cheat on your taxes or something, and you're thinking, I'm the only one. I'm pretty sure the IRS would disagree. But whatever the temptation is to eat the chocolate cake that you just vowed you're not going to eat at New Year's because of your resolution to lose a few pounds, and then the chocolate cake was on the table crying, eat me, eat me. <laughs> you are not new. This is, you are not, this verse is saying there is no new temptation. This is common to, each one of us goes through different temptations, and Paul says something really important to know. What's he say next? But God is what? Faithful. And with every single temptation that you face, this is why I love this. this. This is, I'm actually jumping to the end of the paragraph to tell you where it's going, okay? Because with every temptation that you face, God will be faithful to provide something for you. Do you know what it is? Look at this. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with that temptation... He will provide a way of escape also so that you may be able to endure it. Every single temptation we face, we have to remember we have a faithful God who always provides a way of escape, some kind of escape hatch, so to speak, you know, some secret door to get away from it, something to interrupt us from that temptation and break that, that power of that temptation. God is always faithful to provide a way of escape. 
It's because of his character. Is God faithful just like on occasion? How often is God faithful? All the time. He is faithful every single moment. There's not a moment that he fails at being faithful toward us. So every single temptation you face, and by the way, are they new? Are they, you're the only one? No. Whatever temptation you're going through that, trust me, someone else on this planet has also faced, just know this. We have a faithful God to provide a way of escape. Now, as we're going to recap through this, this paragraph here, starting at verse 6 today, we'll find that just because God provides a way of escape doesn't mean men take the escape hatch or the way out. I mean, do, does God make you take the way of escape to get out of that temptation? He goes, I'm, I've got a, I got you covered here on that chocolate cake. Don't worry. I'm sending in a, I'm sending in a, a, a you know, so your neighbor's going to knock on the door and deliver fresh, gr fresh vegetables. <laughs> Not covered in chocolate, no. Healthy, so you can stay on your New Year's resolution. And, and God provides it. They knock, knock, knock. You're just about to reach for the cake. Who is it? It's your neighbor. All right, I'll be right there. Just wait. And, and we, we have a way of escape. The Lord is faithful. It doesn't matter what temptation is. God will be faithful to make a way out for you. But let me tell you from well, what we're going to see in this. Maybe I shouldn't tell you. Maybe I should just say, let's see what happened with Israel and see if they always took the way of escape. Did they? Did, was God faithful to Israel? Because if you back up in this, in this paragraph, you're going to see that God had everything that happened to Israel happen to them. It says, for whose instruction? Ours. They are a living testimony of spiritual lessons. And if you need some encouragement for your spiritual walk, you know, you're going, well, I'm, I'm kind of struggling. All you got to do is look at what God wrote about them and see the struggles they went through and see the victories God brought them through. And it helps build your faith to know, hey, God got them through it. And he says he did this. Look at verse 6. All these things happened to them as examples for us. Jump down to verse, verse um, 11 of this same, same paragraph. It says, now these things also happen to them as an example for us. This is all just for us so we would know. Now, what was for us? Well, we went over last week, the first paragraph of 1 Corinthians 10 said that they were all led by Moses out of bondage. You know, Israel had been in bonds. They had they'd been slaves in Egypt 430 years. And the Lord raised up this instrument, this man, Moses, and said, you know, you guys seen the movie, Let My People Go. And Pharaoh's like, no, I won't. Yes, you will. No, you won't. And then God sends a few plagues, a few things. Finally, the firstborn die, and all right, get out of here. And they leave. Not just do they leave, but the Egyptians actually, when you read the Bible, the Egyptians actually say, here, take the stuff. We don't care. Just get out. And they send them away, not empty-handed. Some people don't know this. Without even fighting the Egyptians, the Israelites basically plundered Egypt. It was a voluntary plundering. Uh, I say voluntary on the side of the Egyptians. The Egyptians said, here, just take the stuff and go. May you serve your God and may your God, ask your God to have mercy on us because we can see his hand is so strong for you. We, you know, here, we'll bless you so you ask him to bless us back and be free. Well, that's, they sent them and then we saw last week, what did Pharaoh do after they started getting off into the wilderness? Couple's days journey. He changed his mind. Wait a minute. There goes all my slaves. There goes my workforce. There goes my brick makers. There goes my temple builders. Uh, go after them. And he goes after them. And we saw last week, God put a pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night between the, the, the army of Egypt and the people of Israel. God protected them. And then... You guys, we went over the story. It says here that they were all passed through the baptism, this baptism uh, of Moses and, and in the cloud and the sea, and they all passed through the sea, 
They all got to go through the sea on dry ground. So they all had really an interesting experience. They all saw a mighty miracle of God. They, they had the same great experience. They all had um, experienced a, a, a mighty deliverance by God. So you think, well, you, you, you know, with this kind of spiritual, some people are like, I wish God would just do miracles for me. You go, well, what if he just parted the sea? And we just go walking through on dry ground. We'll just cross over to, what, Japan or something? Just long walk. It wasn't that far over there. In, what? Let's just go to Maui, she says. Okay, just, just part right here and we'll just walk over to Maui. I mean, even if we all saw this great miracle and got to go over to Maui today, right, just walking across on dry ground, you think, we, we would go, wow, our God has power. He, he, he. He's awesome. And, and if he was saving us, maybe there was a, a, a imminent danger. Maybe the lava was flowing down the mountain. He's like, nope, it's not going to get you. Watch this. I'll just part the sea. You guys have an escape route. Go ahead. Walk over to Maui. And, and, and though there would be this destructive force here, God goes, doesn't trouble me. I, I got you covered. Could God do that, by the way? Yep. If he wanted to save his people, would he go, oh, that's a little bit beyond me. I, I don't know. Can, can you imagine the Lord even saying that? He'd be like, no way. God could, God could do that easy kind. That's nothing. And yet, it says they all also, they all, they all ate the same spiritual food. They ate that manna we talked about last week. And they all drank from that, that rock which followed them that was Christ. They drank that living water out in the desert. Now, how long were they in the desert? 40 years. 40 years. And I mentioned that someone asked me, where was that? You, you said their clothes didn't wear out. And I, I said, uh, yeah, it's recorded in Nehemiah chapter 9, around um, verse 20, 21. You can read it if you like extra credit. Um, it says that Nehemiah was recounting how the Lord preserved even their clothing, that it lasted for 40 years. Now, some of you fashionistas will be going, I don't even want the same clothes for 40 years. But we're not saying that they only went out of Israel, or, or I mean, out of Egypt with one, one outfit. When they left, they plundered Egypt. Who's to say they didn't go out with a whole wardrobe, you know? The, the, their master might say, here, take this stuff, go. But God said, I'm going to make that last. That's a miracle in itself. To me, this is just a, one giant deliverance miracle followed by another giant provision miracle of food and, and, and water constantly in the desert, and then the provision of your clothing never wearing out for 40 years. It's just showing off God's ability to take care of his people. And then we come to the end of the first paragraph, verse 5, but nevertheless, and this is what we need to pick up today, nevertheless, it says, with most of them, God was not well pleased. And they were laid low in the wilderness. You know that there was an entire generation that didn't go into the promised land 40 years later? Why, why was that? You guys remember the story? They sent in the, the, ten, uh, I mean the 12 spies and 10, 10 came back and said, well, they all came back and said, the land's great. It's all great. 10 of them said, but there's giants. And we can't defeat the giants. And two of them, Joshua and Caleb said, but God can. Forty years, it says they would wander in the wilderness until that whole generation of that didn't believe God could do it would die off. And then God says, I'll take a new generation. But there was two of the 12 spies that got to go leading the next generation. And who were they? Joshua and Caleb. They got to go. They, they believed God when God brought them to the land of 40 years prior. And... Boy, poor Joshua, when you read Joshua 1, it, it comes to, read the, like the first two, three chapters of Joshua, and you'll see the people start to kind of, the new generation, like, um, I don't know, and he goes, all right, that's it. I've already been here. We went in, we spied it out. It was a good land back then. God's made us wander till all the unbelief died, and I am not going to wander again. He's like, that's it. If you guys, he goes, I don't care what you do. As for me and my house, he says, 
We will serve the Lord. You do whatever you want, but we're going in. I'm not doing another 40-year stint in this desert, you know. I mean, it's been a great provision. It's been great miracles and everything, but I want to get to the promised land. And so Joshua, you, you guys remember the story. Moses, he isn't allowed to lead the people in because he smote the rock the second time when he was supposed to speak to it. And then, and then the Lord raised up Joshua. Now, I'm only telling you this as the background because Paul is about to cite a bunch of examples for Israel's spiritual journey that they, in, that they encountered as um, instruction for us. And if you, if you don't know these stories, they, they might not mean that much. I, in fact, today what I'm going to do is I'm going to read you the, the, the verses that he cites, and I'll, I'll tell you where they are in the Old Testament. Uh, but I'm not going to have time to go over each one of them. I'll just I'll sum them up, like a Reader's Digest version for you. But I reserve the right to come back to a couple of them and go in detail to the story where it takes place in the Old Testament. Because if you know the story in its detail, your faith just, I mean, it just like explodes. It's like, you're like, whoa, if God can do that? And that's the example. Now see, when Paul's writing to these guys, apparently... Remember, who was their pastor for a year and a half? Who founded the church at Corinth? Does anyone remember? Come on. Some of you were here when we did the background. To I know it's been a long time. So long ago you forgot already, right? It was Paul on his missionary journey, and he stayed there a year and a half. If you had Paul for your pastor for a year and a half, do you think he might cover some of this information? Do you think he ever told them the story, some of these stories, in detail so they would know? So that by the time he's writing this letter to them, I believe he's just doing one of these um, kind of highlighting, bring back to your remembrance a little highlights of, of stuff God did, just to bring the point out. And the point he's trying to make, well, let's read it together, verse 6. All these things happen to them for examples for us. So that we would not crave something. What is it we're not to crave? Evil things. He said everything that happened to these Israelites was to show us to watch out that we don't go after evil things. They, they, if we crave evil, it, it, creates, it creates something in us that, well, it creates in us really a heart problem where we become discontent. You know, when, whenever you crave any kind of evil, and I'll show you the examples that Paul uses of the different types of evil that the, the Israelites craved, but, but just the very craving of evil makes the people not content with what they have. And so, I'll show you, they wind up going after other things. Other things that spiritually doesn't bless them. It, it, it brings them down. Now, Paul, Paul the apostle said he learned the great secret. Philippians chapter 4. How many of you guys know the verse, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me? How many of you heard that verse? That's Philippians 4.13. How many know Philippians 4.12? One verse before. Go ahead, look. I'm a teacher. You're allowed. This is fair game. You go like this. Turn the page. Go back. It's just a couple pages toward the back of your Bible. Philippians 4.12 says, Paul says this, I know how to get along in humble means, if I have a little. I know how also to live in prosperity. I can live whether I abase, the King James says, or I abound. I have a little or I have a lot. He says, I can live in either place, in any and in every circumstance, I can, I can live. And, 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 and he says, for I have learned the secret. I should charge for this. But I can't because it's in the Bible. But whenever you say, hey, have you learned the secret? What secret? The secret for your spiritual journey. The secret of being what? He says it right here. Of being content. I have learned to be 
whether I am filled or I go hungry or I suffer, uh, uh, have an abundance or I suffer need. He has learned this secret of contentment because he says, for I have learned what? I can do how many things? All things, whether I have a little or I have a lot. It's not based on how much I have to perform what it is that Christ wants to do through my life. Remember when Jesus was giving instructions to the disciples, they had, they had had a crowd come out to hear Jesus speak, and it was such a great crowd. They stayed with him for days, and Jesus said, you know, I fear that if I send them away, they haven't had any food to eat. They're going to perish. They're going to faint on the way in the desert. So Jesus says to, him, to his disciples, this is a setup. Hey, you guys, feed the crowd. Before we, dis before we dismiss the service. Uh, get me have them sit in groups of 50 and, and you guys go feed them. And they're like, what? Lord, if we had 300 denarii worth of bread, if we had 300 days wages, almost a year, an annual salary of one man, they said, it wouldn't be enough to buy bread for this whole gathering. We couldn't even, um, let alone we're out in the middle, no, we're out by the Sea of Galilee. There's no bakery here. Where are we going to get the bread? And what was Jesus' answer? Oh, well, I guess you're all going to starve. No. Jesus, what do you got? So, well, there's a boy here with this, got a couple of loaves and a few fish. And what did Jesus say? That'll do. He took it and he blessed it and he broke it and he handed it to them and said, now give this out. Now, Jesus is teaching them, I don't need a lot to take care of you. In fact, I don't need a lot to take care of a whole bunch of people. But how many of you believe that God could really or really did do the multiplying the bread and the loaf thing? Did that really happen? Was that like he went, oh, man, this is a biggie. I don't know if I can handle so many people. And all I got is a kid's lunch. And See, Paul, I believe Paul learned these same ideas of Christ's ability to take whatever it is that he had, whether it's a little or a lot, and make it be what is needed. He could take care of whatever the circumstance was. And he learned this secret. It is a secret. It, it's, it's a really interesting thing. You know, we've had the privilege of doing feeding for, for, for our community, the homeless, for many, many, many years, 15 plus years. And there's been times when we're like, we don't know what we're going to serve this week. We, we don't have anything. Wonder what, and it's, it's a walk of faith. Now, if you ask my wife, she's so used to this walk of faith, she's like, it'll be okay. God, God's never let us down yet. But sometimes it comes down to like weird stuff happens. Like we, we only get enough to make one pot of stuff. And she goes, well, it must be all we're going to need today. Maybe it's a small crowd, you know, and she makes the, whatever, the pot of chili and she brings it. And, and you know, the funny thing is, is the person working the chili scooper keeps putting the chili on the thing and, and you notice the crowd just keeps coming. And at first it was little, but then it, it builds. And it builds and you keep looking in the pot and you're waiting and it's not running out. And you go, hmm. I have learned I can do all things <laughs> through Christ. Anyone else seconds? It ain't running out yet. You know, until everyone is filled, and then you run out. Now, has anyone ever witnessed a miracle like that today in these days? Where the Lord, I, I've, I've seen it so many times, I just go, yeah, it's not a big deal. Because all the things we do is not by our strength. We do all things by who? Christ. By Christ. Paul says, I learned this. Now, when he writes to the church at Corinth, he's going to cite a bunch of examples of stuff that happened to Israel. And it's really important to, to just, I'll, I'll recap them to sum them up so you can get the, the like broad idea. And then I'll zoom in next week on some of the more finesse details of the story. Maybe like Paul would have done when he was preaching to them, you know, when he was their pastor. But let me show you what he says. These things happened to them so that they would not crave evil things, or so that we would not crave evil things, as they also crave. Now, when did they crave evil things? 
You remember the story in Numbers chapter 11 when the children of Israel started to complain? We're out here eating this. What is it? And that's what manna translates to, by the way. It's Hebrew for what is it. We're eating this what is it stuff. It's on the ground every morning. We scoop it up and we make it into, you know. Well, if you look at Numbers 11, it says that people would go about and gather this, um, this manna. And, uh, I'm sorry, verse 7, it says of, of Numbers 11. This manna was like coriander seed. And it, its appearance was like that of belladum. And it, it, it was... The people would go about, they would gather it, and they would grind it between two millstones, or they'd beat it in a mortar, and they'd boil it in a pot and make cakes with it. And, 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 it, and its taste was like the ta taste of cakes baked with oil. And it, when the dew fell on the camp at night, the manna would fall with it. So every morning they wake up to the manna just being all like dew on the ground. And the Lord would say, pick up what you need for today, every day. They got to pick up what they needed, their daily, their daily portion of manna. And they made well, manna pancakes and manna puas and a bunch of other stuff out of manna, you know. I'm, I'm sure after 40 years they got creative with <laughs> cooking with this stuff. But another place in the scripture says this was like the food of angels that God put down on the earth for them. And after a while eating this stuff, this what is it, they're like, we don't like this, you know, we, we, we want meat. We, in, in fact, it says there was this group. A, I like how it puts it in my Bible. Verse 4 says, And a rabble, the rabble who were amongst them. What is rabble? The, the tro rascally troublemakers? The troublemakers that were amongst the Israelites. They had greedy desires. And the sons of Israel wept again, and they said, Who will give us meat to eat? We remember. Listen to this. We remember the fish which we used to eat free in Egypt and the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. But now our appetite is gone. There's nothing at all to, except for this, what is it, manna. And so the people began to complain to Moses. And Moses... He, you know, Moses is like, poor Moses, he's getting a lot of heat. He, he was just used to see a mighty deliverance. Now he's seeing a mighty provision of God. And they're going, we don't like what God did. It, you know, we liked it better in Egypt. We had onions, leeks. <laughs> oh. Okay, I'm sorry if you like leek soup, but um, not my thing. But these guys are like, we want meat. And, and, the, and the Lord, Moses said to them, he says, uh, Moses said to the Lord, why have you been so hard on me, your servant? And, and why have I not found favor in your sight? You laid the burden of all this people on me. As if like I conceived them all. He, he says, you put this heavy burden. And the Lord says to him, look, so that you don't have to carry this burden. I'll just sum up the rest of this. He says, get 70 elders and I will let my spirit fall on them and they will prophesy and they'll help carry the spiritual burden of speaking to these people. So, you you know, it's not just you. And they did. But it says they only did it that day. Except for two of them. Two of them continued to carry the Spirit of the Lord. And when they prophesied another day later, someone came and said, those guys are still doing your job, Moses. No one else can but just those last two. And <laughs> Moses, is, he was bummed out at the end of the chapter. He's like, he says, you guys are jealous that they're, that they're speaking? And, and Joshua, verse 28, the son of Nun said, um, Moses, my Lord, restrain them. And Moses answered, he said, are you jealous for, for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on all of, upon all of them. You know, what, why are you jealous that they have God's spirit too? Wouldn't it be nice if everybody had God's spirit speaking through them? Poor Joshua, he didn't see it the way that God saw it and, and, and the way that Moses did. But then it says, then the Lord caused a wind to blow and he brought quail in from the sea. Now, how many quail did he bring? How many of you read this story in Numbers? He brought quail in, it says, and till there was just a few that fell beside the camp, about a day's journey on one side and a day's journey on the other and all around the camp 
all the way a day's journey, all the way around. Now, there, how many people were there? If you look back at verse 21, 600,000 men. Moses says, you put me in charge of. 600,000 men, plus the women, plus the children, plus all the livestock. He says, you give me all these to take care of. How big a camp do you need for a couple million people? I'm just saying, realistically, you know, the guys have wives, they have their children. How many Jewish families were like 1.4 children, right? No. I mean, you read the Bible, they're like, what, 12.6 something, you know? They average huge families. Can you imagine how many people were in the desert with him? I mean, conservatively, the theologians say it had to be at least 2.5 million. So how big a piece of land do we need for camp? For two and a half million people to camp for the night. And how do you know where to camp? Well, there's this pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire. And what did the scripture say? When the pillar moved, pack up, it's time to move. When the pillar stopped, guess what? This is where we're camping. I mean, they literally camped around this pillar. Wasn't like any real mystery where to go. God directed them. And he fed them. And he gave them to drink in the desert. And he does all of this, and then they complain. And he goes, all right, I'll give you some, I'll give you some quail. But did you notice how, how many quail were on the ground? How, how thick, how deep? It says here it went a day's journey. In other words, from the outside of the camp, you start walking for an entire day, and you're picking quail up all the way as you walk away from the camp. Except you're going to have a problem with walking. You're going to have to wade. Because it says here it was about two cubits deep all the way around. A cubit is from the tip of a man's finger to his elbow. About approximately 18 inches, we say, foot and a half. So two of those would be three feet deep. Can you imagine three feet of quail for a day's journey? You're hemmed in, buddy. You ain't going nowhere. He pinned them with, when, he, when and the Lord brought quail in, it says he gave them meat to eat to where they were, they were, they didn't just eat quail for a day. No, you read this chapter. I love this chapter. It gets it, it gets really good. They they they, <laughs> they eat the quail. It says and it says that they ate it all all day. They spent all day, all night, all the next day gathering the quail. He who gathered the least gathered ten homers. Homer's like a huge bushel, you know, the, the least, the guy who gathered the least, we, we'd say like a clothes basket, okay, just make it a little easier for your mind. Ten clothes baskets of quail for the guy who had the least. The guy who had the most, now I've gone quail hunting, and I've cleaned quail, and I've eaten quail, and it's not a lot of meat, okay? So you need a few of them, but if you give me ten clothes baskets full, I'm pretty sure I'd be full. And yet, these, that's the guy who has the least. And they, they, sp <laughs> they spread them out around themselves. I could just imagine. I went, you pluck quail. You have all these quail feathers, these little teeny feathers. you got to clean these things, right? How many quail feathers are they going to have? With a couple million people. You're talking about down. Yeah, it's time for down pillows. Oh my gosh. And while the meat was still between their teeth before they before it was all chewed, the anger of the Lord kindled against these people, and the Lord struck the people with a very severe plague. And the name of the place was called Kibroth Hatava. It means um the grave of lust or greediness. He literally because they lusted after they or they were greedy for this meat. They're eating angel food, but that wasn't good enough. They had, they had a lust, a desire for something else. And so Paul cites this as the first thing that we should look at that happened to them for our example. Be careful when you grave things of greediness because what happened to them? Well, a severe plague and many of them died. And then the next verse, verse 7, back to... 1 Corinthians 10, he says, And don't be idolaters, as some of them were. It says, as it was written, the people sat down to eat and then to drink, and then they stood up to play or to revel, we, we, you know, to, to fool around. And That's in Exodus, by the way, 32, 
when and we'll come back to that next week mahalo for joining us if you'd like more information about us go to our website amazinggracekona.com and click the link to follow us on facebook that's amazinggracekona.com mahalo and god bless